from Croaky here and I've outsourced my job at the moment now to Ruth D'Souza um, and we're at the Centre for Culture, Ethnicity and Health. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? And we're talking to Demos Krutsos, who you're the director, director here. Uh, and Ruth is currently going to interview you for me. Yeah, I, ne I never get to interview my boss. But, but, but could we please start with just a little scan? I might just do a little zoom around please, here. Please, please do. And you start telling us where we are. Well, we're actually on the grounds of Victoria's largest public housing estate. Uh, this was established in the 1970s and uh, we have been on this site for the past 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very interesting uh, in a city uh, community in, uh, in Melbourne uh, and one of the most culturally diverse communities um, in Australia. How many community health centres are actually on the ground of housing estates? Very, very few. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of actually any others. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is quite a unique location mm -hmm. and we were expressly uh, established to provide care um, to this community when uh, all of the old workers' cottages that used to occupy this site were all demolished uh, and these wonderful grand structures uh, were then built uh, in the 1970s. Um, and, and this is one of the things I really love about talking to my boss as a Kiwi who's moved to Melbourne. Demos has this fantastic grasp of the local history of the area. Um, but also, Demos, you've had the chance to see how things have changed. So in the 40 years that you've been coming to work at this place... No, I haven't been here 40 years. <laughs> you haven't been here 40 years. The centre's been here 40 years. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> now, that you, now that you say that, Ruth, now that you say that, Ruth, I actually grew up here. That's right, yeah. Okay, so I know you've had a connection to the area for I've a long time. I've had a connection time. to the area. Yeah. So uh, I went to school in the local area, primary school, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, and I've lived in the local area most of my life. So actually, yes, I do know the area very, very well. Your parents uh, were post-war migrants? My parents were post-war migrants and my father actually had a shop in Victoria Street and so I grew up here, I went to school locally and uh, and uh, and then I, and I've continued to live in this area ever since and now I've worked in it for the last 25 years. 25 years, sorry I was ageing you there Dara. <laughs> um, but Demos, what are the changes that you've seen in the time that you've been in this area? And um, I, th I think it's a useful background to the seminar that we're going to have to just talk about some of the trends that you've seen. Well, clearly the most dramatic change has been the gentrification uh, of Richmond. Uh, these estates, this public, ha this public housing estate, has stayed quite, um, it's been quite, um, it hasn't gone through the sort of dramatic demographic changes that the rest of, the, uh, uh, of Richmond has gone through. Uh, it's still largely a place where uh, first arrival migrants often come. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a home, the first home for many people arriving um, in Victoria. So although the estate itself changes dramatically in terms of the composition, uh, particularly the ethnic composition and the country of origin of a lot of our residents, the community around the estate has changed very, very dramatically. And the other thing has changed very, very dramatically, which is part of that gentrification process, is the uh, fact that this was an industrial suburb, mm. a heavy industry suburb of Melbourne and employed uh, thousands and thousands of people. Now, of course, all of, that, all of that industry is now gone and uh, new families and new people have moved into the area and they largely work in the service industries, white collar people, people with higher education levels. So it's a very, very different community. And that means there's been a loss of a pathway to employment, has there, for the yes. community? Yes, because uh, people moved here because as a newly arrived migrant, you could uh, work, uh, you, you, you didn't need to have uh, the higher levels of English required to work in the service industries. Uh, and uh, and all of that, and you could um, get a job, particularly your first job, in an unskilled uh, industrial uh, area or in a factory or whatever. Uh, now that that pathway to employment has been um, has been um, greatly reduced, except for women who still are able to get some part-time work, uh, particularly in retail. So I've still got a rock, strong retail sector. Uh, a lot more difficult for men uh, uh, for whatever reasons, but yes, it is difficult. So in terms of um, the work that CH does, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about it, Demos, and how perhaps you've seen a change over the last you know, couple of decades. Well, one of the most, uh, one of the very unique uh, aspects uh, of this location and, 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 and why it's very important for CH is that uh, we are actually are surrounded and deal with the sort of issues that CH is trying to deal with on a statewide and national level. And they are really the issues of uh, inclusion, 
uh, and the issues of, uh, of ensuring that all of our health services are provided equitably to everyone in the community. So we experienced this, we experienced this uh, uh, or we deal with this issue uh, in the other part of our organisation, North Richmond Community Health, uh, every day. And so it's a great learning environment for everybody at CH to be able to understand how to change our practice to be able to address those issues of access uh, and to and inclusion. How unusual is it to have a centre like this also part of a community health centre? Uh, it's unique hmm? in Australia. Uh, there is no other example of this and uh, CH is a unique organisation nationally uh, and um, all credit to the Victorian Government to fund this organisation and that's why we do a lot of work not just in Victoria but nationally because of the, um, uh, of the unique experiences uh, and resources that we've developed to respond to the issues of inclusion. And Ruth, do you want to ask Demos about um, the symposium next week? Yeah, well, I mean, Demos has been a wonderful supporter of um, the ideas that we're developing through the, the research stream. And one of the ideas I put to Demos was, what do you think of technology, Demos? Should we, should we talk about you know, health technology and what it can do for our communities, given your commitment to equity? And so, yeah, I'd love to know what you think well, about it, Demos. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for us um, because th these are very, very contemporary and cutting edge issues that we're trying to deal with and to try and think about what's happening in the broader, in, 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 in broader society and how it might be applicable to people of new arrivals uh, and, uh, and immigrants and, and refugees. Um, interesting enough, uh, one of the stories that, uh, uh, that I think is very salutary for us all is that people tell me that one of the first things that gets established in a refugee camp anywhere around the world is a mobile phone tower. Mm -hmm. And it's extraordinary how many of our clients, they might have, they might arrive in Australia with very little else, but they'll have a smartphone. Uh, and that provides us with a very, very unique opportunity uh, to very to think how we might innovate uh, in, in a very uh, creative way, uh, not just our communication strategies, but in our, 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 our ways of building relationships of trust with uh, with these communities, and that is fundamental. At the end of the day, people will use health services that they trust, and this is the lessons not just in the work that we do through CH, but if you talk to Aboriginal communities and other communities, they'll say the same thing. They want to uh, uh, to attend services. Uh, that they trust and that is why I think this is a great opportunity uh, with these wearables uh, because it facilitates the development of those relationships of trust. Can I just ask one um, not quite related question? Um, we, we, with the new government and the new Senate, we're seeing new debates now that are sparking a lot of concern around racism and bigotry, yep. etc. Are you observing the impacts of that in any way here? And do you have any sense of what is the best way to have debates that maybe need to be had, but without causing harm to others? Um, always, uh, and, and it's not just in Australia. But internationally, as we're aware, there has been uh, huge community debates around issues of uh, diversity and around issues of immigration and, and refugees. And we've seen that in Europe, we've seen it in the United States, and of course in Australia. Um, the, this always has an impact. There is no doubt in my mind this has an impact. People are not isolated from these issues. People are well aware of the debates that are going on around them, and very, very often people uh, take these issues to heart and feel them personally. There is no doubt in my mind and that has been the issue since I've been here uh, and this is not the first time we've gone through this type of, uh, we've dealt with these types of issues. But when there is heightened community um, uh, discussions uh, of these issues or advocacy around all sorts of views around uh, race, ethnicity, um, then it has an impact on our community. and. Um, what and should government be doing to, to make sure that it's safe for people? Well, it, it, it is, from my point of view, I, I think Australia, and Victoria particularly, has an extraordinary record of successful integration, uh, social integration, and we can build on that. And so the, the, the policies of multiculturalism, which have served us very, very well in Australia, it is probably the most successful, uh, and it is often commented upon by international observers, it is one of the most, the most successful social policies of the post-war era 
There is no doubt about that. Very, very few countries have been able to achieve the level of successful and peaceful and respectful social integration uh, of new arrival communities. So, because we have this very firm foundation, uh, and I'm very, very pleased to hear now that our political leaders are saying that we will maintain a non-discriminatory policy with regard to immigration. These are very, very important, rather than throw uh, more fuel on the fire with all this stuff. That's the worst thing we could do, was to inflame those views and to, uh, and to give uh, comfort to people that do want to uh, practice or say things that are harmful to our, our fellow citizens. So it's, I think that in Victoria we have a fantastic opportunity, we have great leadership uh, in Victoria, not just political leadership, but so leadership in community leadership uh, and people speaking with one voice um, uh, about these sorts of things. And I think that stands us in good stead uh, for the future. So I'm less, uh, uh, if you like, I'm less concerned, I have less concerns um, than, uh, for example, if I was working in Europe or somewhere like that where the debates are very, very uh, impassioned inflamed and um, and create some deep social division uh, and I don't get that sense here but of course people people are people and uh, they experience things uh, at times in a hurtful manner thank you Denise, and thank you Ruth Cup thank reporter. you Mary it's been great right. talking to you thank you